and welcome. We'll start off by uh, taking the apologies for uh, Kevin, Jason and Colin. Welcome John as an observer and uh, past uh, incumbents and to our Office of Colleagues and to our new uh, Deputy Pudlo. Deputy Chief Executive. Deputy Chief Executive. So, uh, and all of us here. And we've also welcomed KPMG to the meeting. So, shall we move straight to the minutes? Uh, there are no disclosable interests, are there disclosable interests? All party whipping arrangements tonight, are there? No? Alright, let's move straight to the minutes then. Could those who are present confirm if they're a true after a record? That's a no then, or a silence rules applying. Happy, yeah. thank you. Richard, are you happy with the mix? I am indeed, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I think there's one of those best set minutes I've seen in a long time. Excellent. Any matters arising for the minutes? Yeah. 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 There's some feedback for you. Good. So, shall we move straight on to one of the main events of the evening? And, um, Ask our, our auditors to present their external audit report 2016-17. Good evening and welcome. And we know you have a colleague in transit, so but no, I'm welcome to come in. And in. Um, if there's any really difficult questions, then I'll. Um, so um, my name's John Gorey. For anybody who doesn't know me, I'm the um, director responsible for your audit. So in our report. This is, if you like, our main report of the year, um, the results of our, um, our, our work are really included in this. Um, I will therefore sort of turn the pages, if that's okay, Chair. Uh, please do, please do. Uh, and therefore can sort of focus on what I think the key messages are on each one. Um, so, um, let's go straight to page six, which is really the first, um, the first, substantive content. So hopefully you'll remember we had a bit of a conversation about all the plan a few meetings ago uh, and one of the things we included in that was around the changes in the pension liabilities due to the triennial evaluation and we had a bit of a discussion at that meeting around what was go going on in terms of the, uh, the changes. So um, essentially this involved for us looking at the um, data to be submitted to the actuaries and looking at how the figures coming back from the actuaries made it into the accounts and also the way that management look and review that information and basically that's all absolutely fine so I don't want to dwell on that. Uh, moving on to page seven, we had this new disclosure requirement which is about trying to present your information more in line with your own um, committee reporting and, and the way that you normally look at it. That requires uh, new, new statements, new notes, uh, restatement of last year's figures, um, and so that involved us both talking at the interim audit about what was planned and then looking at those changes in the final accounts, but that was also all fine, so I don't want to dwell on that too much either. And then finally on page 7 is the provision for business rates of appeal. So we look at that because it's one of those numbers that is an estimate. Uh, those ones which are not, not sort of calculated but have to be considered in terms of judgment. Um, but we're happy with that provision. Um, and uh, so again, don't particularly want to dwell on that, but happy to take any questions on those ones, 6 and 7 before I carry on. Any questions from the committee? John? No? Please do. So then moving on to page eight, uh, we've got a set of uh, judgments uh, that um, we've looked at, which I've already cut, touched on, the NDR one. Uh, we've also got property plant and equipment that um, we'll perhaps touch on more in, in, in a minute, but in terms of the, the way in which the valuations are used and the management review of them, um, we were, in terms of the, those estimates, we were happy with those. So, turning to page nine, uh, this is where we've got our proposed opinion, which we're proposing to provide an unqualified audit opinion tomorrow, the 
because tomorrow is the end of the month and the statutory deadline for uh, the submission of those opinions. So actually, we've done the audit quite a long time ago and probably you know, finished the, the work um, quite quite properly, but this was the date that the committee structure was you know, already set for. Next year, we have to complete the audit and sign off by the end of July. So um, the work that we did this year showed that you know, we, we should be able to achieve that because we have completed the audit in, in that time last year, this year. Uh, in terms of the uh, the accounts, we, we noticed some adjustments here, prior period adjustments, which uh, we'll perhaps come back to in, in a minute, um, and Orton might want to say some words, words about that. In terms of the current year adjustments, there was only one um, adjust, significant adjustment um, of for one million, which doesn't actually have any bottom line impact, and there were a small number of other sort of presentational adjustments. So um, that's probably all I say on that page. The AGS and the narrative report are two other, are two Sorry, other key. The AGS and the, and the narrative report are two other key statements that we've also looked at and that are fine. Um, Page 11 really talks about the process uh, that we went through with your finance team, which is where you know, you've noted some of the, the good arrangements in place, that you strengthen financial reporting so that you can produce your accounts in, in the short time scale, um, and that the working papers um, that underpin the, the accounts that we use as our basic working documents um, were of good quality. All good in order. Okay. Page twelve. Um, there's a there's a recommendation that we debated at some length of this committee last year around um, journals, and essentially that was a matter where you know we felt there was something that could be you know was not uh, in in a perfect place, but the issue for management is about what the cost benefit of addressing that is, uh, and uh, you know, you've taken the view that it's uh, it's best left as it is, and we understand that response, and so that position remains the same. Can we pause there? We can. Because I'll ask this, the question again, where you accept the management responsibility to monitor the scenario of risk. What is evidenced by management? Because it says not fully evidenced. So what is evidenced? Uh, are you asking me? Sorry. I, I am, yes, yes. As, our, <laughs> as our financial guru. Yeah, yeah, I mean, when we looked at this, in terms of um, various officers being able to uh, sign off on journals, um, and it's the fact that that certain officers can prepare a journal and enter it themselves. Um, and what we went through with the auditors, which I think is why they're satisfied in terms of the risk and everything else, is that the processes around that and, and what happens within the systems and how it's monitored and everything else, uh, and our structure, that we're satisfied that there are processes in place that that is not an issue. And I'm sure Asim uh, uh, is nodding with me along with that, so I'm hoping that that nod means that he agrees with what I've just uh, reported to members. I'll open it up to the committee, would you? Thank you. Um, last year, the auditors were quite clear in wanting to make the recommendation that they did. This year, they haven't been quite as unequivocal as they were last year. Is the recommendation being restated, or are you accepting the management's position as a valid one and not withdrawing it? I mean, the, the position hasn't changed at all. In terms of our audit, we can find plenty of good ways to get sufficient evidence in order to complete the procedure. Um, the how you might want to improve controls, you know, is a matter for your management, and it, it doesn't stop us providing an unqualified opinion. So that in that that's how so it's presented in that term. 
I think in terms of work that we have done this year, is what we looked into is the compensating control around the journal. So, they, like there is apparently a deficiency in the system that someone is not reviewing the senior management journal. But what we looked into the okay, what are the compensating control around the environment in terms of journal control environment, and we are happy with those compensating controls. That yeah, there is a risk, but there are other controls in place which will in, in, in terms of the broader control environment gives us the satisfaction that in terms of financial statements there isn't anything which we need to be worrying about too much. So therefore you're not restating the recommendation? No. One of the things that we are seeing is that when management provided us the evidence, like some of the things around properly documenting the evidence should should be there it means they are doing the stuff but they are not actually documenting it or formally signing it off so what we are saying to the management is going forward yeah, you're doing the control but properly evidencing it so that we then come back and properly say yeah this is being done okay that's it yeah uh, it was on the same sort of lines i'm just wondering um, if if everything has been satisfied and, and, and uh, you, you don't seem to well, the words are, we accept they're responsible, continue to monitor this area of risk, and we're happy that we can draw a line at that point. Right. But my question was about whether the recommendation is still well, formally on the record. And I'm no, because if, if we were formally going to re-raise it, it would appear in Appendix yeah. 1. Okay. So, so my question is, is, is how long does this continue to appear as something in the past? It won't Maybe. reappear next okay. year because it's not on Appendix okay. 1. Okay. So, so once, once a year's passed now, then, then that is a done and dusted exactly. issue that it's all been, everybody's happy with. Yeah. That's, that was the question. Thank you. My question is that, does the Chief Financial Officer have the ability not to take up any recommendation? Or... Because, well, otherwise, it, not why do we do this, but if a recommendation was made, and then because you felt that the, there was sufficient, I mean, I'm not saying there isn't, but because you obviously felt and it's obviously been proved in this situation that that is fine and the recommendation isn't going to appear again, but does that mean at every point you could say, no, thank you, I don't think that's right? Or not. <laughs> uh, if I may, members, and uh, I'm sure uh, my, my colleagues here, uh, we have many debates <laughs> over uh, whether we agree or disagree on points because, unfortunately, whilst we are dealing with numbers, it's not always black and white in terms of, you know, whether you're estimating something or things like mm -hmm. that. And we have various debates over, you know, whether something's a a prior period adjustment, or is it a post balance sheet event? And we can have many discussions. What what we do get to uh, as professionals in the end is is a, a balanced way forward that enables KPMG to say to you that these um, accounts uh, that they are able to sign off with an unqualified opinion. Um, now, if there was anything that we disagreed on so vehemently um, that they weren't able to do that, then, then I certainly wouldn't be recommending that I disagreed with their, with their proposals. Any other questions? That, I mean, that is quite a good way of putting it in the sense that we have to, the line as far as we're concerned is about whether we can sign the clean opinion or not, and that's where you get into the the nuance above or below that will really define the nature of the debate that we have. So in this case, we're happy that we can sign that qualified opinion. And, and I think that, that that is the issue, isn't it? Because I, I actually um, did some research on what unqualified opinion meant, because it's just probably good to be honest. <laughs> and it says, a fairly and appropriately presented and in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. I just don't know why I'm going to say that, rather than, because unqualified <laughs> sounds like it's not right. Does that make any sense? It's uneducated. Uneducated. Yeah, uneducated. Well, I'm not professional. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think that always is the acid test, isn't it? That, that this may be a little issue, but at the end of the day, you know, are, are we solid? Are we solid? And I don't think it's right. As long as I know, that's, that's cool. But it's a good debating point. 
So, yeah. moving on. Um, so, what I move on to is the, 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 essentially the first proper recommendation around the, um, the way that the, the prior period adjustments and the sort of the, perhaps the scope then to ensure that uh, both the scrutiny the conduct, the scrutiny, the valuation, and the maintenance of the fixed asset register, and the, uh, all, all the elements that, that contributed to those prior year uh, adjustments um, means that the scope to um, you know, formalise some of the documentation and, and approaches there. I think there's, a, there's some paragraphs in the revised draft accounts which cover the specific uh, prior year adjustments, so that explains in detail that those issues, what we're talking about here. So those, you know, those adjustments have been made, if you like. So again, we're happy. What we're raising here is the control issue arising as a result of that. Uh, so um, that's, that's. So the, the point you make in a, in appendix uh, in that comment then about valuation reports is covered off in appendix one and two. Um, question for um, what you monitor mm -hmm. is um, although the deadline is the 31st of March 2018, how will we know that uh, the officers have complied and fulfilled that recommendation uh, during the course of the year? Um, and there's a couple of other areas in the pack where there are recommendations and action points with dates in, and we need to look at how the committee scrutinises against those recommendations and uh, there's almost an action list I mean I would be used to having an action list at the back of the minute I know we don't necessarily do that mm -hmm. but we ought to have an action list that brings forward all of the dates on the recommendations so that we know that the actions around the recommendations through the reports through the course of the year are covered off by the due dates and there's other recommendations in other papers mm -hmm. Yes, we don't know how they're going to, what the points are, what they need to achieve, and by when, and how they're going to get there, the sequence. And I do recognise this is an end of financial year date, so it's, it's relatively uh, a long way away, but one would expect ordering in a usual efficient way to have put in the control mechanisms by now, or, uh, uh, on both of these, for example. Well, for example, Chair, I can tell you already that we've met with the business team with regard to valuations. And um, I think um, even with regard to this particular action, um, these meetings did take place, but um, the recommendation is, is about sort of more formally documenting the discussions that were had. So it's not really introducing anything new that we, we haven't been doing already. It's about giving that process. audit trail yes. and process there. And so that's a I key element of the role of this yeah. committee is to check process, yeah, yeah. isn't it? And, and in terms of that deadline being the end of the year, I mean, that, that's when we have to have the valuations. Uh, I'm really using this as an example. What I would say is that deadline could yeah. say... Because as we go through the pack, you'll yeah. find there's more. And there are specific dates as we go through the pack. I think, Chairman, the question was directed to me initially. Yeah. Um, you have got the work programme on the agenda later on, and perhaps as part of the work programme we can look at key actions to feedback on mm -hmm. progress and get that programme. Right, okay. Thank you. So we would then, we'll report back to you in due course as well once we've reviewed the presentation. Okay. So, um, moving on to page 13. Uh, this is about completion. Sometimes there's more to do after this meeting than than there is in this case, where you know, as I said earlier, we've done you know 99.9 percent on a, a plan to sign tomorrow. So, um, but we do emphasise here the uh, and declare again our independence and objectivity, um, which you know we review at various stages in the audit. We're going to cover the management representation in the, in the meeting and, and take, completely take those away with us. Um, and there are no other matters that we, we need to report. So moving on to value for money. Um, and here I would take you straight to page 18. 
So essentially what we focus on in this area is looking at your planned use of resources um, and the, the sort of key ways you do that, particularly in the winter term financial plan. Um, and we look both at how that plan is constructed and then we look at some of the, you know, what are the contributory key schemes or projects or, or, or both additional income or, or programs of, of reducing expenditure. So, um, I mean, the big picture is that we're, we're happy with that. Um, like all, you know, most councils, because of the reduction in RSG, your, you know, there is a gap to close. Um, but you're in a, in, a, in a better position than many, um, which reflects, um, you know, the usual special, your context in terms of the, you know, the history you have of undertaking development, the extent of development land and so on, things like that, that allow you to, you know, flex your muscles, if you like, more than some other councils can. Um, so essentially, we're happy to conclude that uh, appropriate arrangements are in place. In the course of doing our work and looking at some, some of the specific projects, we raised the point around the final documentation when um, the Chief Exec gives the final approval to go ahead with a, a scheme. This is under the process that you, you have agreed and you know the, the, the projects are taken to members in the appropriate way. But this is just again looking to um, evidence the approval of that in a slightly more structured way. And that's recommendation two. Yeah. And that is something that comes across quite clearly from your narrative and the recommendation that things have to change then. And the more formal documentation and explanation on the um, internal procedures and standing orders need to be looked at. And I don't know if that's a matter for the constitution at some point, Tony. And documenting the process of disposals in the way suggested. So clearly that isn't done yet. So we look forward to seeing that in due course. Any other questions, Katie? No? Okay. At which point I will, we can move to the appendices. Appendix 1 and 2, in fact, we've already covered. Uh, appendix 3 um, is some of the detail on the, the order adjustments. Um, you know, ha happy to take questions on, on that or to explain it in more detail, but they relate to the three elements of the prior period adjustment and the other adjustment I mentioned earlier. So those are the most significant ones. Any questions, committee? No? Okay. Appendix 4 um, is about materiality. Appendix 5 um, expands on our declaration of independence and objectivity. And the Appendix 6 covers our audit things, which we are required to disclose to you that are charged with governance. And that really is a massive increase. But a, a certain increase. Um, happy to take any questions on the report. Richard? Um, I was wondering if KPMG could explain why they have to charge us an extra £4,000. Yes, happy to explain. Um, I mean, a number of reasons. One was the additional work that we talked about earlier, both on the trial valuation and the restatement of the CIES, which were you know, additional to what the scale fee had been set to originally. And then in addition, there was the, the additional work we had to undertake in order to uh, make sure that the prior period adjustments were appropriately treated. So this was work that you hadn't anticipated before the Exactly. Okay, just a question on that. I take it that that's, that's not just dropped on the council to pay. That is something that is uh, negotiated and um, because you wouldn't just drop a bill on saying, oh, by the way, we need extra work. Surely you, you identify it in advance and say, 
by the way, this may cost us this. Is that how it works? We, we try and communicate that with the officers as soon as we can, and we've certainly been talking about it for some time. Right. And then there's another control, which is under the PSAA contract, any additional fees have to be approved by them. So they give it, the tyres of that a good kicking as well. Right. So, so you don't just present the bill to the council and say, oh, by the way, we had extra work to do. It's, there is some... There are processes. Processes. And we certainly can't do Because this is taxpayers' money, isn't it? And this is the, you know, quite important that we, we understand that um, you know, if we expect a certain amount of money to be paid to the auditors, that that is the amount of money it actually is agreed and takes. Uh, with regards, I don't, know, I, don't, I don't know about these things, how you justify an extra three grand, four grand. Um, but it's, as long as there are processes in place and it's not just being dropped. And that the includes you know, hourly rates and uh, an expectation to explain. So you have a complete breakdown yes, of exactly. the expenditure. Exactly. Fabian? I mean, could this work have been avoided from either the perspective of is it something that we have done as a council that allowed the work, required the work, extra work, or is this something that had, wasn't picked up on in the order earlier on that therefore made it? The answer to that is the first two no, because they were you know, additional requirements on the council and on everybody, all councils and on all auditors, and the third one yes, because that related to your specific issues around the prior period adjustments. Um, I would like to ask you a question, and, but maybe it's not relevant to that, because next year you will have to submit the audit before, uh, because we have that to do at county and county. Mm -hmm. We have to do it by July, uh, June or July. Are we going to be in the same boat? And if we are, we'll have, we will have a surprise on another extra bill, because suddenly you will have to do much more work quicker. Doing the audit earlier, we're already doing the audit at that time scale and that shouldn't, that's mm -hmm. no reason for that to lead to increased fees. So I am very pleased with that, so next year I will not see the £4,000. Depends what comes <laughs> up of course. <laughs> Shall we ask order to comment? Uh, uh, she's waiting very patiently. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, if I was to add my own action point to this, KPMG report, I would say that I would question as to why a triannual valuation wasn't known about at the time mm -hmm. of setting yeah. your audit fees, being as they happen when they do. Um, so, should have known about it, to be fair. Um, I mean, the, the, the answer to that is we're not setting these fees, they're set in, you know, quite some time in advance by the PSAA. So, in fact, in some cases, it's, it's you know years ahead. So they're not they're not taking account of some of these risks that arise on a year by year basis. So I, I don't wish to drive the point too much, but the triannual valuations happen every three years. Enough, yeah, every three years, and have done for some time. So um, when they're setting these fees, I would suggest as part of an action plan, they should review the things that they need to include on an annual basis. I would certainly agree with that. Um, with the best will in the world and then to defend actually the position, uh, I mean in terms of the audit fees, they've certainly come down considerably yes, yes. in previous years and there's a lot of pressure on to get that work done with sort of a reduced amount if you like. So with regards to the extra work that had to be done, um, you know, and that's unfortunate, but you know, controls in place and the types of things we do, it's not always avoidable. Um, but we certainly try to minimise the costs involved by engaging with auditors early on. Um, but we can't possibly eliminate them uh, for sure, guaranteed. I, I, I think it's right to challenge it. I, I think certainly with regard to, say, from, from a member's point of view, with regard to, um, uh, you know, if you have a, a budget for this, uh, and if the budget's exceeded, that's actually people's money, people from our county's money. So we need to make sure that we are, we need to ensure that we are happy. But um, it's my money as well, isn't it? That, 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 it, that we're not, um, and it's justified and there are proper processes in place, and et cetera, et cetera. So, so I think it's a fair challenge. Um, but on the other hand, as long as everybody's happy, then. Yeah. If I may, Chair, you know, they are challenged. We don't just accept these, and I'm sure uh, 
John will tell you that uh, we've been through these uh, robustly before settling on this particular figure. <laughs> I'm always glad to hear that another robust <laughs> <laughs> Anything else on this bit of the papers? Four percent? Yep. So we move to the recommendation paper to start with and then the supporting papers. So on page 40 then, um, they, uh, on the response to the first recommendation, um, we've touched on already, sorry? Would you like me to introduce the report? Oh sorry, Roger. I'm so, I feel brushing them on. <laughs> You know, I'm so used to you being, you know, ready to come with the answers. I forgot you wanted to introduce it as well. <laughs> I don't think he dug himself out of that one, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. I, I think I'll just look sums it up. It wasn't a robust thing Come on then, Audra. Uh, members, if I may, um, I, I'm, I'm delighted, really, in terms of the way this process goes, that we've already had the benefit, if you like, of hearing the assurances of our external auditors um, that they've been through the accounts and what's presented to you in this particular report, we then have the confidence that what's presented is, is true and fair uh, and has been challenged and checked along the way. Um, I'm delighted that we've sort of embraced that process uh, and we were able to produce the accounts um, a month early so that they could be handed over to KPMG. Uh, on the 5th of June, which meant they could come in and do their audit early. Um, so uh, I'm very confident that we are ready for next year. Uh, and like I say, that process has already started um, in terms of meeting the valuers, which is really one of the, the, the big components of getting the accounts done um, for the work that uh, goes into that. Um, so. The statement of accounts, uh, and you'll know from the processes from other committees, your, your approval tonight is about the process that's been gone through to put those accounts together. It's not about why did we spend so much on this or why is there a variance on that. It's about the process of pulling these uh, accounts together uh, and that you're happy with that. When, when you approve them. And that's where those changes in that you've had the benefit of KTMG to tell you that uh, our house is in order. Uh, it certainly helps that process along. Um, and obviously, quite happy then to go through the management responses that our chair is eager to, to do um, from that. Um, so on page 40. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you'll see that uh, our response there in terms of, uh, like I said, that the process is already well embedded um, and maintaining documentary evidence will enhance the audit trail. Uh, we'll be a Gary being here, uh, one of the team that, uh, in the business team. Um, but those, those meetings are being held and we are starting to document them and the debates that we have so that we can have early conversations with KPMG for next year's audit. Um, do you want me to pause there, Jane? Yeah, I think that would be helpful. Is that okay? That's quite right. Jane. Are you sure? <laughs> Committee. We covered in terms of the uh, narratives and recommendations uh, some of the points we raised about the evidence being given to the committee later because I think it, it fits in all three of those. Do you have any other questions on the report section in the whole report and then we'll go to the letter and then the pack itself is that all right? Just checking. So with the report, any points or questions on the report beyond that that we've already discussed with KPMG? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah good. I'll, I'll go ask a question in a minute. I've got some more there. The, the letter of representation is just the standard letter, isn't yeah. it? It's just more like that, in a sense. No, nothing different in there. Are you all content, committed with that? Because you have to approve it really, for me to sign it. Yeah. Okay. Then, in terms of the statement of accounts themselves, we've got some new bits, haven't we? Yeah. 
And whilst I found the accounts themselves interesting, really, Jack? Yeah. <laughs> I am going to stick to comments about the new bits because the comments about the rest of the contacts is not really our question, although I have a number which I want to look at later. Um, but there's um, what I might call a business information pack or an impact statement that we put into the accounts as a new piece. And that's really um, around uh, pages 67 onwards. And I think the comment that I, I would make as somebody who's used to reading these is they're still bloody impenetrable on them <laughs> yeah. as accounts for the labour. And that isn't because you've tried to do it, it's just that they are, and that's the way the structure is. But in trying to provide other information, which we've got on sorry, um, things like on page 68, 69, uh, which is quite interesting, um, when I, I looked at it and thought of it as a layman, uh, a resident, as it were, looking at the accounts, and I don't know how we suggest changes to what you might want to put in for the next time. Because I thought, for me, there were some things in here that would make the whole reading of the accounts easier by just having some more information in this bit that you tried to make much more user-friendly. We can make it even more user-friendly, I think. Uh, I'd be happy for a chair or any member of both of this committee under this council to make list. suggestions and email me at their okay. leisure. So I don't know if any colleagues felt that, A, it's a good move, first of all, but actually we can help make it better by giving them some further advice and suggestions and guidance to make sure that that happens. It, yeah. If I may, Chair, as well, that uh, you will recognise some of the contents of uh, the narrative report because we summarise from some of the reports that are produced and presented to members. Um, so uh, I can't uh, lay claim for reinventing the wheel, and this is really a summary um, yeah. from other Because Colin's not here, which is a bit of a shame, he was chair of the He would have been quite helpful, but I, I, you know, I've just got a couple of, well, about 20 suggestions <laughs> for you. That, As I say, Chair, happy that to would, that would help, I think, um, to do that, just to make it a little bit easier to read. But the one area that I did want to question in terms of um, process, as it were, is the process of reporting based on the standards that you've talked about. Because we seem to chunk up the organisation into four areas. But it's actually very difficult within those four areas to penetrate and understand stuff that's going on without spending a long time going through the detail. And I just wondered if, if that is the best way to granulate what we're doing in process terms. Or is this driven completely by the standards that you have to follow? Page 19. So you've got Chief Executive Business Community Resources as that, with the whole accounts are chunked up. But they're quite big chunks in terms of the areas of spend. They are indeed, uh, Chair, and um, when the budgets are set, uh, there is a breakdown further behind that uh, and for each of those areas. And uh, we're required to summarise those in, in the financial statements. Um, so it is a process, it's the standard that you're following. Yeah. That you're in That's why I think then the suggestions over the stuff in the front bit might help and assist. So I we'll think, come back to um, that way around. Yeah, uh, I'll wait to see what those are, but obviously I would refer you as well to the budget setting process, which gives the detail behind that, and then certainly the outcome <coughs> reports that are reported to members go down to a, a level below that as to what each manager. Yeah, but this is the public facing document of the council, isn't it? As is the budget yeah. setting. But this is what people now look at. We're we'll always looking at the accounts first. That's where people. That's one one one. One is going to to first. Hang on, I put it up to the committee rather than it just be an order of mixture. Committee comments. No? Yeah. 
So, so the photo is a narrative, so the problem is whatever narrative you have, um, if it's too long, it's become a bit of latitude. And um, uh, because I've counted, I mean, we used to have a big narrative and we cut it to, to, to a lot. So, um, so the, the problem is, I don't know who in our uh, the people who have elected us who look at that because they are so Irish. And, and that is the nature of an audit report. I mean, they are not very interesting. Except if you need, sorry. <laughs> no, but sorry, except if you want to find something. Uh, it's not what we want to, to achieve. It is the past and if we are going in the right direction. But it doesn't set. Um, it's, it's already what we, we have decided, so it's a bit um, written in the stone. That is the way I see the audit report. But should, I, should we read, what, 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 what are we trying to achieve by the narrative report? What actually are we trying to achieve? Is it, is it informing the public? Uh, is it uh, trying to present it in a way that is more stable? Well, actually, is, is, is our objective. Members, if I may, when you pull a statement of accounts together, yeah. they are not for the average lay yeah, yeah. yeah. And even in terms of you members approving them, it is expected that there is a certain amount of knowledge there. Yeah. So, whilst some people may go to read it, it, it is not your average no. um, Joe Public for want of a better word. So we minute that more um, effectively. Yeah. Um, what we do do um, in terms of the, the general public, uh, I don't know if you read Dumtree Corleone's chair. Oh, I certainly yeah, do, yes. A summary of accounts that yeah. sets out how we spend our money. And what this statement of accounts is doing is really summarising for the year or all of the financial transactions and the narrative report is trying to put the story around right. those figures and um, what I was hoping members is that uh, you may, may have commented on the fact that the narrative report uh, was improved from last year <laughs> and uh, there, is, there is always We started off with a pre sandwich order by saying it's so, an improvement and it's good but we can help to improve it. Uh, there's always room for improvement. There we are, you yeah. see. So that's where we started, Audra. Yeah. So if we come back to my question, which is, so, so this is, a, a, the objective is to inform the public. That's the objective. No. No, it's not. No. It's Who's it to inform? It's, it's a statutory oh, oh, requirement okay, okay. to produce a statement of accounts. For what objective? WPLC. Are you talking about the actual figures or the narrative on the front? Well, the, well, the, whole, the, whole, the whole thing. What, what, what it's, is? It's transparency. Yeah. Right. It's about for, for the for, for so if anybody yeah. in the public wants to see it. Yes. I so 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 that. the purpose of this is to yeah. inform yeah. The, the, the or to publish uh, the accounts of the local council. So the people. Uh, can actually dig into them if they want. We're offering taxpayers transparency. Well, what we should be doing is producing a document that you need other documents to be able to decode it. And that's essentially where we are today, isn't it? So you would need to take, David calling by way of example, and the nice graphs and charts about our expenditure that's in there, this, this edition, actually explains all of this a little bit better than the narrative does at the moment. And it's how we make sure that all of our documents as a council are self-contained and stand alone, and you shouldn't have to refer to other documents to understand the one you need in. Well, but that, that, that was the purpose of my question. My question wasn't to be critical of anything, or, 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 or it was just actually understanding. We all need to understand exactly what the purpose is, and then the next question is, do we think it's fit for purpose? And, and, and that, that really is the question. Even if it's bulky, is it actually fit for purpose? And if it's fit for purpose, that's up to you. We, we, can, we can suggest the ways of, of, of improving it, but ultimately, uh, does it say what it says on the tin? And, and quite frankly, it does. So I'm not too sure on whether we are trying to refine something that may well be, because of its, its sheer complexity, is unrefinable. Does that make any sense? Yes, that does that make sense? Yeah. So, John, would you like to add? I would. Uh, 
Going back ten years, talk about impenetrability. It was, uh, you know, you, it was tiny print uh, and it was full of figures. Uh, this this document has one specific purpose, which is the statutory purpose that order is identified. It has evolved, however, into a form of communications document. I mean, when we talk, when we look at the non-financial performance of the council section, you know, it's, it's fairly gushing. Uh, it's, it's almost straight from down to court. So you know, it, it, is, it, it has obviously evolved, and frankly, the, the, the introduction of a few half dozen pages at the beginning, I think that's absolutely super. Uh, you know, if you're a brand new member of the council, read the first dozen or so pages, and that brings you right up to date with everything that's going on. I think it's fantastic. Nick, you, it's interesting that you spotted exactly this point that I spotted earlier, yeah. um, because this, this is, I think this is the first year we were required to designate in these four brackets, isn't it? Sorry, uh, Chimney's Egg Business Community and Resources. I mean, that's, that's a relatively recent change that we're year. having to yes. identify the uh, income and expenditure by those generic terms. Um, and, yeah, I mean, they, they are, they're, well, they're there what they are. Um, it, it may be that for future years we can, uh, or this I you think about, we, we can think about s at least some gen general description of what is, is within those headings, yeah. general terms, yeah. and possibly even some um, breakdown, uh, which is you know, going a bit further. Um, you know. But uh, I mean, business, for example, well, 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 you know what I mean, I don't yeah. the details. Uh, because, I mean, and in, in fairness, Nick, this is the, I think it's the first you've had to deal with it in this fashion. Uh, and so there, there would have been a bit of uh, uncertainty as to what is the best way of doing it. And that's why I said I thought it was good, but we can help improve it. Yeah. Just to answer the, qu the question sort of specifically around the narrative report and what it's um, trying to do is that, you know, there is guidance from SIPFA which, you know, they think they have a debate. It's not a debate that many people hear, um, but they think they're having a debate with us and you know some of your professional staff around uh, what what this is. So they set out what they're trying to achieve and they suggest some some types of content that you might have. So there are words that say what the narrative mm -hmm. statement is trying to achieve to answer your yeah, very specific yeah. question. And essentially they are saying that like any other you know any other organisation, the numbers alone don't tell the whole story and you should try and provide some context. And I think you know, this isn't, um, yeah. I think this is a pretty good effort. And then this goes back to my second part, is that once we understand that, it, if it's achieving it, it's achieving it. Now we're talking about refining it. Oh. So, so the actual document is is there. It is exactly what it, it, it's supposed to do. And and and, and that's comforting. Uh, with regard to, can we improve it or not? Well, I'll put better minds than mine on that one. But it does it, it, it achieves it, it's readable. So, not too sure where the debate is taking us really in parts so. or um, Yes, um, as Audra said, it's not for people of the street to read it. Even for me, so after uh, an hour, my eyes are closing, and I'm not. And it's, uh, it, it is, um, but uh, I do agree that I'm recording uh, it's what I do ask all when I go to the parishes people to read if they want to understand and if there are questions, if they think we don't spend the money wisely, they can come back to me. Uh, now that, as far as I'm concerned, the audit, uh, what I like is that it's getting a bit more palatable for, for us, but it's still not very adjustable. And I find that if I, I look vaguely, and, but um, do I understand them 100%? What I do understand is when KPMG, if they say that they give uh, value for money and they are satisfied with the account, I think they have done their job and therefore protected us as an authority. Uh, because I'm not a professional accountant. So for me, that is a way. We can all look at the uh, report and need be I think, be better. But for me, the, the most important is that the audit qualifies the account. And, and after, uh, it's a document that is read by 50 people. 
in the whole district. It or, was very lucky. If, uh, <laughs> so, so, uh, no, it's, no, no, I don't think it's great. That is even 50. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay, any more questions on this whole uh, uh, pack of the KPG yeah. report, the report, and the report? I just want one final point about it. Let, let, let's not, you know, we're not going to be the only one that does that. Yeah. 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 If there, are, if there are quick wins, quick wins. If it's doing its job, you know, it's doing its job. So I just wouldn't, wouldn't want us to be creating lots of work for everyone on the centre. So that, that's just a... a As I said, we can we make suggestions yes. to order outside yes. of the committee, mm -hmm. if there's things yeah. you want. Yeah, and I'm sure we shall receive all of them very Yeah, early. but, 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 but it, it, would, it would concern me if we are adding a burden on something that's actually doing. Well, let me give you an example of one of the things where, where I think we could add. If you look on uh, right, page 29 of 208, you've got the bottom of that, the future Devon Council funding requirements. So we have a duty uh, to understand the risks there, and all, all our financial team are by the risk management process. If you look in the documents, it does explain, although it's almost impenetrable, what our, re our income sources are and where we get the income from. But if you if you saw the first bit that's going, oh my gosh, we've got a funding gap coming in the KPMG report, where is that funding gap explained in simple terms of how we're going to address it in the financial report's narrative? Well, it isn't. Yeah? So actually, you could explain bits in here that support the work that KPMG have done, or vice versa, given the hand in glove, in terms of saying we have principally four income sources, for example. And those income sources are this. But one of them in particular is going down, and that will create a funding gap for us in the future. And we talk about that risk through the document. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we're charged with is making sure risk management is applied through the organisation. And to me, that's a really simple example of how we could explain something slightly different. So, sorry, if I, I'll just have a question, Chair, Chairman. Basically, we would like in the report to explain the bridges and how we are going to bridge the gap. Yes, but I wouldn't do it in this lot, in, yeah. the, in page 75 yeah. through to 139. I'd put a little bit in the front bit to yes. explain it. Okay. And I think that would help people understand, and then some of us, some of the members are not sure understand that concern or where we are, let alone appreciate what the size of the gap is, which is eloquently advised um, in page 29 of the report, given the current medium term financial plan. So to understand the answer to that, you've got to go to another document called the medium term financial plan to understand what the solution to that is. So as I go back to you, we shouldn't be producing documents that need you to refer to other things when a small paragraph could explain it. So if I can go back, please, to page 39 um, to look at the advice on paragraph two. Um, first of all, we have four um, matters to resolve. Um, item C, we are suggesting the word noted is changed to endorsed, given that we are uh, dealing with the value for money conclusions contained. We should be noting them, we shall either accept them, endorse them, or reject them. Uh, we should be noting those uh, conclusions. Um, so can I ask the committee to uh, endorse them and approve the four resolved items on block, unless you want to go through the individual. I'm suggesting one block. Yeah. Okay. Happy? Super. Um, do you need to stay? Well, we were, are we going to do some signing? Or yes. Do that later? Uh, we, we could do some signing now. Could we, we do it now? Sign some documents. So. Okay. Um, shall we go to page 147 then? And I will ask Tony to introduce the report uh, and go through that, and then we'll come back to it. Okay. Uh, yes, Chairman. It's uh, a report of the Monitoring Officer and Chief Financial Officer, but I, I'll just advise that the report was authored by uh, Simon Bowlby, uh, whilst he was still here as Monitoring Officer, and it sounds quite happy to, to present some to 
Um, our constitution requires an honourable report to this committee um, to uh, make you aware of any breaches of um, rules and regulations. And essentially, this, this is what the report is doing. Um, we go up to section four, um, the information. Um, we've got two sets of breaches. Um, the first set um, uh, is described from section 4.1 through to 4.1.7, and they deal with uh, the use of um, purchase cards. Um, you'll see that there's three separate incidents there. Um, the, there's a brief explanation of, of each in the papers, and um, we have put in place um, a training um, to make um, staff generally aware of, of the issues and certainly there have been some more detailed discussions regarding some involved in those particular issues. And moving on to section 4.2, uh, this deals with the second set of breaches which is uh, are around um, procurement and there are, are six um, cases there. Again, um, the uh, brief details of each um, uh, issue is set out in the papers um, and again we have um, dealt with this by um, discussion with um, officers involved and also some, some general um, training. Um, I just draw your attention to um, the bottom of page 150 um, and this, um, so just find the right words. Um, talks about training. The last couple of sentences of, of page 150 talks about um, training um, that the monitoring officer um, asked to be carried out, and indeed that was. Uh, and he also um, required a service manager of the business team to attend the committee to assist with members' understanding of the team's response and future approach. And um, Gary Underhill is, is here this evening for that purpose. Thank you, um, So. Um, in conclusion, um, the, the, the various breaches, as I've set out, there have been essentially two sets of breaches, or, or two themes, one to do GPC cards and one to do the procurement regs. Um, no losses have arisen from any of the breaches. Uh, breaches were addressed, um, but the need for additional action has been just appropriate. Um, the um, culture of the organisation is one of self-reporting and a number of these breaches have come through in, in that, um, that way but also they may come from um, other sources including in, internal audit. Um, but the monitoring officer's final, final sentence there was a, a culture of transparency remains right to encourage in terms of staff reporting and committee consideration. Thank you. So shall we ask Gary to um, respond to the uh, statement on the bottom of page 150 to assist the members' understanding of the team's response and future approach. Um, yeah, I think that the report summarises pretty well what action has been taken. Um, there were a series of unfortunate breaches in 2016. Um, they were all investigated. Um, and uh, I think the conclusion in the report is that there was no deliberate or fraudulent malpractice, which is, is the important uh, message. Um, uh, there were genuine mistakes. Um, all the staff were reproached about the mistakes. Um, and uh, as follow-up to that, um, to reinforce the rules and to clarify the rules, um, there was a series of training uh, events held um, which were compulsory. So um, further up from that, um, staff um, are now consulting the corporate procurement officer fairly regularly on um, uh, issues regarding procurement, um, where there is any uncertainty, what they're supposed to be doing. And as a result of that, um, I am not aware of, that there have been any breaches um, since December 2016. Today? Yeah. If I can, Chairman, I can confirm that's the case, no further breaches have been reported. So the message seems to have sunk in. Um, 
everybody's getting the hang of it, and um, if, they, if they are unsure about something now, uh, they do consult the corporate account officer to make sure. Before my colleagues leave pit, because I mean, one or two are, are champing in the bit there. Um, one of the things that, in terms of the team's response and the organisation's response, Chani, is is there a lessons learned log approach to these sorts of incidents? Do we actually formally document the lessons learned so that we can make sure that other teams understand the issues? And that I think the self-reporting is really important, but serving is serving is ensuring that there's a corporate memory. And if we don't write stuff down, we don't have a corporate memory. In terms of corporate response, I think that that would be down to um, Scott or Tony to um, advise yeah. on that. I think, but I think I think the training may have been corporate training. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that that is the case. I think each um, uh, breach is uh, is reported and recorded, and um, where there are lessons to be learned, uh, corporate learning, those are picked out of those breaches. So, in in the case of the procurement um, issues, where well, they, they weren't entirely in Gary's uh, team, there was an incident in the part of the organisation, but they were, um, the training was um, mandatory for all officers across the organisation who were involved in procurement processes. So in paragraph 4.2.5, the last sentence there, that applies across the organisation? Last two sentences. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And in 4.2.8, uh, from the word indeed to the end of money procurement, is there a plan that does that, or is that part of Scott's plan to test that? The rules originally drafted by the business team need to be reviewed to test if the controls are excessive. So is there a plan to review and test the controls as part of the constitution? Yeah, yes. Chair, as part of the, part of the constitution review, we, we have a, a working group of corporate procurement and efficiencies working group, which will look at the procurement rules in, in the first instance and make recommendations for it. Okay. I'll look up for you. Oh, well, my comment was going to be, why have there been so many in procurement, but the fact that the training has happened now and across the board, I think is fantastic and the fact that we're at zero six months on is even better. But obviously there's, there was something there beforehand that caused six cases to occur. So we want to make sure that it's procurement this report, but it's not another department the next time. And so that we make sure that we are picking them up earlier. Though, you know, uh, and instead of case one, at uh, case one rather than case six for training. Um, that would be my point. Yes, well, I think it's a good point, and I think that has been um, recognised by management. And um, whilst um, training was put in place, it wasn't because there were six, it could have been because there were one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but well done, sir. Richard. Zero. Yeah, it's just. Uh, it's all to do with, it's a bit like crime watch reading these, I'm not, not saying, I find it fascinating looking at case studies, from just one eternity. But, um, but it is about, you know, what, what, why why are these, like, the purchasing parts, mistakes being made in the first place? Are we not training our staff correctly? Um, if we are training our staff correctly, and then they are breaching it, then, you know, to have three cases and, you know, expressions there like after they've been humbled well you know sometimes if I'm not saying I'm not saying that somebody should um, be be well, I am I'm saying that the example is made that if 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 people aren't being trained right in the first place that is a massive organization I think but that's if it is people breaching haven't been trained then breaching that's more than just a mistake isn't it that's neglected duty um, and 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 therefore, why isn't something something done to actually, do you know, this is so serious. Again, this is public money, these and these and these and these, these are. Uh, I'm just wondering, are we happy that we're, we're getting it right with regards to the messages we're sending? Does that make any sense? Is that all there? Yeah. 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 Ye
Now, Ms. Ivanek, when you look at these breaches, these aren't where people have gone off and used the car on, on, on a jolly. This is where um, proper business of the council has been conducted. Yeah. And uh, certainly in some of these instances where, you know, for instance, they were procuring stuff for uh, the tea trolley, for instance, uh, and the person who normally did that had moved on, so the person covering that job you used the card um, to procure whilst we were waiting for a new one. Um, now, it, it's it's not it's getting over that culture of you know you, you wouldn't give your own credit card away, but it's this was in all of these instances really where people are trying to get the job done. Um, and reiterated to them, they all know how to use the cards and everything else and what they're for, and it was all for legitimate council business. And really, with, with those, those officers trying to do the best they can in a situation, now it, it's been reiterated to them, you know, that they must treat it like their own credit card. Uh, and um, it, you know, some of them may well take umbrage at the fact that they were just trying to do the, you know, the best that they could at the time. So it's getting over that importance that um, you know they must treat that card as their own. Um, but to to look at this in context, they were doing genuine council business. Okay, I wasn't because if they'd been nicking stuff, they'd be arrested. Well, a different right? thing. Yeah, yeah, yes. absolutely. This is yeah. what I'm talking about. That. Yeah. I'm talking about now we're in a position where it is judged that disciplinary action would be appropriate to expect from managers now everybody's been given a warning, you know, so yeah. we are actually ramping it up yeah. because of course this is not acceptable and if people are making shortcuts, but, you know, for, for me that, that's a big thing, it's, it's getting the job done and getting it done in against regulations, against the things is for me is a serious breach, it's a neglect of duty, it's actually taking shortcuts which we should not be encouraging in any way and not even trying to smooth the walls by saying they were only doing council business, they were breaking rules and for me it's about ensuring that we, we don't in any way put tacit or, or approval or tacit understanding of what they're doing, what they're doing is wrong and are we happy that we are sending out the right messages um, and, and and so it's really just a, a question of do we think we are because I think these are serious, these are all serious and um, and I certainly when I was running an organisation if officers were actually doing things for the right reason and breaking the rules you know that's that's discipline offence discipline offence full stop. Richard, sorry, Arthur Richard. Yeah. So, 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 so it's just reassurance that yeah we're, we're on the right round. We now have a business where dis discipline action will take place. Everybody has been given a warning. We are now not having any more of this. Is, is that where we are? Uh, the, the other positive point I'd like to make is that um, whilst these breaches are you know, you know unhappy that they're there, uh, the comfort you should take is that we're picking them up yeah, as well yeah, yeah, yeah. in terms of the processes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know this isn't going undetected. So from that point of view. See that there is a process there that we, we wouldn't tolerate that sort of uh, attitude or mentality, uh, and it's taken very seriously. Uh, and we say in the report that after all of that training, all of those reminders and everything else, that disciplinary action would be appropriate. So, yeah, okay. um, I think so that's so getting the message out there now. as serious as, as yeah, okay. you take it, we do too. Thank you. Um, I agree entirely with everything the first Richard said. Um, I wasn't totally happy with Audra's response, for the first response that is. Um, I don't think anything Richard said implied that these people were on a jolly and I think that was entirely fair as a response. Rules are rules and you're going to have rules to operate effectively as an organisation. They should not be broken. Clearly there is something going to miss here in terms of the management oversight and running of this team and hopefully that will all now be dealt with. I would expect senior management to be looking carefully into how it came about in the first place and to be sorting out whatever needs to be sorted out. But can I ask a question about the council beyond the business team? If this is going on, this level of adherence to rules in the business team, given everything that we said that yes, this got reported, how do we know that there isn't the same level of ignorance about proper process elsewhere in the council? Thank you. Well, I can respond to that, Chairman. The, the, the all these cases don't relate to the business team. There are um, one, one of the uh, purchase cards for us, another part of the organisation. Yeah. Sorry, the bulk of them are the business team, aren't they? Well, two, of, two out of three of, of the um, purchase card issues. 
Um, there are controls in place and these will be picked up. So we don't apply different controls for the business team than we do to the other teams. Um, so um, as Audra has said, you, know, you should take some comfort from the fact that those controls are in place and have picked up um, uh, these, these breaches. So my question was that clearly within the business team, they either didn't know the rules or they did know the rules and were ignoring them. So how do we know that isn't happening elsewhere? Do we know what people elsewhere in the council know about the rules? We, we do. And, and we, we know it's not happening elsewhere because our, our controls would have picked it up if it was happening elsewhere. Um, training has been rolled out um, across the council and awareness is made across the council of these issues. Cecile. Yes, um, speaking about uh, in one way because maybe uh, being, uh, I'm sorry, not being sensitive being a woman, we know that sometimes you make mistakes and uh, uh, or, or you want to do something very quickly. Uh, and that, I don't that in Arabic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but we, we some, would so. <laughs> No, but um, uh, what happens if somebody uh, having been to the training and so on, make a mistake and suddenly realize it's a mistake and come to you. I think it's two things. You know, sometimes you do uh, because you think you do the right thing, you do it, and after you say, oops, and my little training, what have you put in place when somebody come and is honest and, and come back to you? Because I think it's two things. If somebody tried to, what I think in the Perfect world, you make that and no more mistake will happen. We live in a world which is not perfect, so maybe other mistakes can happen, but if the person realizes very quickly that they have done the mistake because they have the training, and if they come to you, do you have something in place that is not as drastic as if it's picked up by somebody else? But I, I think, I mean, what we've said and what we will do is take disciplinary action. Yes. The outcome of that disciplinary action will depend on the um, circumstances of a particular case. Thank you. I think if we're looking, I mean, obviously training was brought up at the end after the incidents that have occurred. But is there any way that we can incorporate more statutory, um, or mandatory, rather than statutory, sorry, excuse them, um, mandatory learning and training for people? Because having looked at some member development, having looked at the mandatory training, some of the, you know, manual handling is obviously important. I'm, I'm not taking away from that. But there are other areas, such as procurement, the processes, because these are all processes. These are just people who are under pressure, who are either of a temporary nature, someone has left, and, and it's all coming down to the processes that they haven't followed which are processes across the board that maybe we could look at more structured mandatory training for yeah. people. Um, if, if I'm going back on that chairman, what we have put in place is targeted training. Yeah. Um, because not all officers um, take part in procurement yeah. processes or have GPCs or access yeah. to GPC cards. So we're targeting the training to those who need it. Right. Can I take this back then to page 147 and the advice of two uh, matters to be resolved. Again, are we happy to take those on board? Yep. And I think, Gary, you uh, can take back to your colleagues how seriously their members take these things and um, we welcome their self reporting and hope it carries on, but actually, we don't want to. No, I know. And we congratulate the zero. Yeah. I move to page 153 then, um, corporate complaints. Mm -hmm. If you'd like to use the paper, Tony. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is your annual um, review of our corporate complaints um, stats. Um, and, um, the first thing to say is we've, we've made all changes to the uh, process or procedures um, in the last couple of months. Um, so we are preparing uh, things with apples in this particular. Case um, that will change when we come to the Ombudsman's uh, information uh, later on. Um, session 4.2 um, starts looking at the stats for 16-17, um, and we have a summary on the summary table, table 1 on page 155, with a more detailed uh, table on page 158. 
Um, if we look at table 158, it tells us we had um, 1,429 complaints um, that resolved at stage 1, 126 at stage 2, and 32 at stage 3, um, giving us a total of 1,587 complaints. Just in terms of comparison um, from uh, last year, we had um, 1,359 complaints in 1,516, so there's an increase of uh, just over 200 um, from 1,516 to 16,17. Um, and those largely are around our environmental services. Um, and I'm sure members are aware we are coming to the end of our um, arrangement with Baby Enterprise, um, but the complaints are not falling away um, uh, during the sort of latter part of their contract. I think uh, else in, uh, elsewhere, in terms of comparison, the percentages um, dealt with at the various stages are um, very similar to the previous year. In fact, you can uh, pick that out at the table one on page 455. Uh, any questions on that before we go to the audience? Yeah, let's deal with these. Um, the thing that came across for me was 1516 versus 1415, so 1.5% growth in complaint, which mm -hmm. was reasonably manageable. But 1617 versus 1516 is a 16% growth. And uh, so there's quite a chunky increase there. Um, and whilst it appears that quite a lot, uh, as page 158 demonstrates, in 1142, there's almost as many complaints in one uh, service area as we had in the whole of 1415. So clearly, is there a lesson in there for the council about how it manages the end of life of contracts? Because these all seem to be coming from like one service area. I, I think, Chairman, there, there's lessons to be learned from that particular contract um, that we've had problems with from uh, very, very early on in, in the life of the contract. Um, I think it is difficult um, to um, expect, or would be unrealistic to expect, any significant change in the performance of the contractor, uh, particularly now we're into the last 12 months of the contract, and therefore to expect a, um, a drop um, in, in those complaints, I think would be unrealistic. Do you see any comments? Have we got some, are we going to be more stringent when we come down to not the new contractor in terms of what we can do? Because it is more than likely that this will go up in the next, when we report on it next year, because that's the final year. And we can probably safe to say they're not exactly going to, as you've just said, be working harder to alleviate it is not actually making being more difficult about it. Um, and um, therefore, we want to be in a stronger position with the new contractor. I, I think, if I may, Chairman, um, in, in terms of the end of the life of this contract, and I think it is reasonable to expect the service to certainly uh, get any better, uh, and then we'll go into a transition period with a, a new arrangement which will mean some changes in how service is delivered okay. and those normally uh, pick up a, a number of complaints as people get used to the new service to them. I think in, in relation to the um, delivery of the service, it, it's not a contract as such, it's a joint venture. So we have much more influence and, and control over what goes on as part of that. Um, part of the control mechanism is a uh, stakeholder group. Uh, I'm aware, I am aware that Council Guildford has sent something around to members um, in the last couple of weeks looking for um, expressions of interest to join that group. And part of the role of that group will be to monitor performance and complaints about the service. Yes, um, I think um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we have those uh, numbers, page uh, 158. Uh, once um, every three months, we have a sort of an email telling us a complaint and, and, uh, in our inbox. But uh, when I looked, uh, suddenly um, the waste and, and refuse and the public space is, is very high. And um, uh, the thing is, it doesn't seem to appear to members in our emails because otherwise maybe a lot of members would have been a bit more vocal. 
So I don't know why, because I'm sure we have, every three months, mm -hmm. we have a, an email telling from the monitoring of it. I don't know, is that from... A, uh, uh, German, you know, there is a quarterly yeah. report which comes yeah. out from uh, the community monitor. Yes, exactly. Uh, which looks at report, uh, complaints for, yes. for that quarter. Um, and it's sent to us, but somehow um, I never ticked that it was so many complaints in the public. So it's not presented the same way, or I don't know. No, the, yes. the, the information is presented on, on a board by board basis um, um, rather than the subject basis. I, I'm not sure entirely, yes. but we can we can check that out. Yes, could, could you please? Because that would be easier for members to have the same kind of document if that is possible. Yes. Do you think that would be helpful? I'll, I'll leave it to Tony to come back to Thank you. Richard A. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> you know, compla complaints are just feedback, really, aren't they? It's not nice feedback, but they are feedback. And it was just a more a sort of a, a general question, perhaps a cultural question of, of the organisation. You know, do we, do we, have there, have there been any policies and procedures that we have changed as a result of complaints coming in with regard to the way we do business? I, I, I don't know whether we do any of that sort of analysis, but, um, you know, I have an organisation and of course complaints against police were were, were always looked at with regard to trends with regard to people's general behaviour, etc., etc., organisational behaviour, policies, etc. So, do do we have that culture whereby complaints and, and uh, we've got examples where you know we can say, yeah, actually, you know, we, we've had areas where as a result of complaints we have made differences, which then has actually dealt with the problem. So, is that, is that fair? Yeah. Um, I think for you, Chairman, I, I'm. I'm not able to offer any examples of that, but I'm sure that is happening within the organisation. Um, what we will have is that the service-specific complaints will go to the service managers, and they will then look at that and look at patterns, and will um, uh, take any learning from, from those patterns in, in terms of improving the way service is delivered. Um, but as I say, I don't, I don't have any examples it, it of that. It would be nice, Chair, I don't know whether it would be possible, without causing more work, but it would be great to capture that in, in, in the complaints, the way that you know complaints are influencing us as an organisation. I think it's very healthy, very open, very transparent. And I think it would be uh, actually a, a good news story that complaints aren't just about um, worrying about getting beaten up by the public, but actually uh, it actually helps us influence and improve. I think I don't it's actually given an example of that because the new contract for environmental is now going to be a joint venture and not just a contract. So yes. we've changed a whole way of operating yeah. for the next cycle based on based on complaints. Yeah. That was the driving yeah. force. Um, and service, those are things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but well, the yeah. complaints were a, a, a yeah. really important tool in that decision. But I, I, I don't know how easy it'd be to capture that. If it was a massive issue, I, I wouldn't be able to that. But if it was possible to capture, if they are going to the service manager, you know, I don't know. It, it would be very interesting to see. And I think also good things to put in there. Uh, looking at a different way, the way complaints are actually influencing the whole business. Yes. Which again, I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, you have to be very careful how you respond to complaints data. The word feedback yeah. is a very important word, but complaints are only a very yeah. small part of it. And I think we need to be careful that we don't create an industry setting people to work doing things that actually aren't justified by the figures. It could you, you mustn't lose sight of the fact that out there, the overwhelming majority of people interact with this council in any way whatsoever are perfectly happy with what they get. The fact that some complaints come through is, to judge from the previous item on the agenda, may be a good thing because it shows there's a process for monitoring them. And things will always go wrong somewhere, and there will always be vexatious complainants who come what may, will always complain about things. So you have to put all of this in a context. The numbers are not massive. We need to look at it and we need to be mindful of them, but we mustn't take them out of proportion. I would like to see some sort of more general feedback data if it's available. I'm not trying to get people to do things that they already do, but it would be useful to know what the context of this is against the public as a whole's perception of what is possible. I think that's a really interesting point because 80% of the complaints were on service area, exactly. which we know we've got a poor service on. Take those and out. And even in that service, the majority of people are happy. Because well, they're not. Number of they're, not. Yeah. they're just not making complaints. Yes. Across the whole district. They're still not happy across the district. 
but then we're doing something to change. That's not what I see around where I live, I think, but I'm okay with it. Fabian. No, no, thank you. Okay, Cecilia? Yeah, but also, we, we have complaints stage one, stage two, and stage three. So a lot of complaints fell after, you know, they, they must be resolved because very few escalate, which that is what we should also look. Because if uh, if somebody uh, uh, on complex stage three, we just uh, in, in public space, we just have 32. So I think a complex escalate normally. So that is also maybe a good story. Well, there were more stage two complaints in housing than there were in the whole of last year. Yeah. I wonder why that was. Anyway, Tony. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think just to uh, pick up on a couple of points, I, I, I think one uh, Councillor Swift has, has just made. Uh, I think uh, another point is if you take the uh, environmental services out of, out of this, then we're looking at relatively small numbers within each service area, and it will be um, unlikely that there are huge patterns within a small amounts of, um, of data there. But I'm sure there is some learning going on, and we can perhaps help by illustrating some of the learning in, in, in future um, future reports. Okay. Ombudsman's report. Ombudsman's report. Yeah. Yes, Chairman. Um, just to draw members' attention, Appendix 2 is um, the bottom half of page 159. Yes. Um, and that essentially is the um, format of the information we receive from, from the Ombudsman. Um, we're not able to do um, a meaningful comparison year on year, um, as yet again the Ombudsman has changed the format in, in which um, she or he presents the data. Um, what we can say though, into, though into, in terms of numbers of complaints, um, the stats are on the bottom of page 455. Five complaints made uh, during the year um, compared with um, 18 uh, previous year and 12 the year before that. So the number has fallen significant, significantly. And only one complaint upheld uh, by the Ombudsman. Uh, and the um, uh, brief explanation to that is um, on page 156, um, the last paragraph before the information. So, in conclusion, um, I would offer that our uh, internal complaints procedures and the results of the Ombudsman's um, report um, show that we have um, good systems in place and ask that committee. Um, resolve the effectiveness of the current customer feedback from complaints procedure and associated complaints and handling the endorsed. So that's the advice on page 153. And we have to take that single resolution. Uh, this chair. Yeah. Thank you. Moving to page 161 then. There you go. What is this called? It's got four. Audrey, would you like to introduce the paper? Thank you, Chair. <laughs> uh, the committee will know that we determined we were going to take uh, a full external assessment of our internal uh, audit service. Uh, and this report gives the results of that particular assessment. Um, if we go over to page two, the audit assessment covered uh, those listed at the top of the page. Um, uh, it was a, an extensive uh, assessment that was undertaken. Uh, the final assessment of which is attached to, as the appendix to this report. Um, you, you've got comments there from both the monitoring officer and the chief executive. Uh, I think I uh, just want to pick out in particular myself in terms of the overall results for this council fair favourably. The assessments undertaken at other similar size authorities uh, reflects the value depending on the stakeholders, management, and customers have of the internal audit services here at Daventry. Confirms that the service provided to the council is fit for purpose and effective. Um, I suppose sometimes you, you, you get a feeling for, for what a service does, and, and certainly. Um, the reliance that I place on, on Scott's team and everything else, um, this this external audit and the results has sort of certainly come out with what we expected. There's always areas for uh, improvement and an action plan, um, and I think that's reflected in the actual results of this audit. Meeting Fab. 
Um, my question would be purely, we've, I know in the past, Scott's team have had, got a struggle with recruitment and staff staying on board. This obviously means a, there's, a work, there's a lot of work. Uh, we can, do you have the team in place now? And do you feel you have enough? For sure. I mean, a lot of this was reflective of the 16-17 um, um, situation which we reported in the annual audit review. Yeah. Obviously, the next uh, point on the agenda will be my um, progress report for this year, um, which confirms that, yes, we're, we're fully um, staffed and uh, Well done. Sorry, Chair, if I may, in response to that as well, it is a, it's a 151 statutory duty to be satisfied that there are uh, ample resources in terms of uh, order. Excellent. So we move to uh, page um, one seven zero. Now, earlier I made the point about there are a number of dates and actions. Mm -hmm. uh, this uh, report uh, clearly outlines a series of actions and dates when they should be completed yeah. by. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the kind of thing where I would like the officers to be reporting back through our meeting cycle. Uh, the actions list and report back on completion or otherwise as we go through and not just put it into other reports but refer back to this so we know that at the end of the year because I think they're all due in 2018 mm -hmm. the end of 2018 cycle we know they've all been completed I guess right. this report yeah, can I just, um, yeah in terms of um, uh, reporting back on this this in effect will be our integral um, uh, quality and improvement plan going forward um, and as is the case from when I do progress reports and at the end of the year we will certainly give you progress on, on, on that uh, uh, implementation of these recommendations and by the end of the year we'll have confirmation of the achievement of those as well. But I'd specifically like it to the relate week, to this table They will be in some way. specifically pulled out from this in a, yeah. in a very similar action plan. Yeah. yeah, so almost another column down the side. Exactly. Progress and complete, whatever that. Yeah. Because some, some look quite difficult to do. Mm. They are. So yeah, it's I, quite I think tight. it's a challenge in terms of tight time scale yeah, with some yes. of them, but yeah, we're we're happy to try and sort of get those service improvements in place. Yeah. Would you? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I agree with you, Mr. Chairman. That this is the sort of thing that we ought to monitor to ensure that it is done. Uh, I hear what the Scott says, and that's fine. I would suggest that maybe we adjust the recommendation and ask that this actual table is brought back to us as a specific report at whatever period of time we think best with a progress report on the individual items until such time as the whole lot is cleared or we decide that we're not going to carry on with whatever's outstanding. That is the case, it will be. Okay. Yeah. So, how would you like to amend the recommendation and based on the fact that the officers agree? <laughs> well, I don't quite know what the officers have got in mind. I mean, will we, can I ask Scott if he's bringing this back as a specific report, or is it just not to do with that? I mean, I am um, within the duty of, um, uh, under the standards um, that I'm uh, duty bound, um, one of the requirements is to include this as part of my quality assurance and improvement plan. So I have a duty to bring it back to you as part of my monitoring reports and the annual audit review at the end of the year. So it is a requirement on me to do so in any case, so it will form part of my reviews rather than being a separate report. But it will be clear and distinct within that report. Yeah, I'd I, I like that to be not it, but buried in other reports. I think that's the issue that we're, we're, um, we're dealing with. I think, Chairman, I think um, to clarify, we'll bring the action plan as, as presented with an extra column as an appendix to that report. Okay. So, if we can amend the resolution then, um, to read something like, you ready? And that progress against the action plan is reported. Not that quickly. Progress against the action plan is reported at each subsequent meeting of the committee until the table is complete, or the actions are complete. Are you happy with that? I am. 
Okay. Anything else from the committee? I thought a worthwhile exercise, very stimulating conversation, and enjoyed by telephone call. <laughs> Anything else? Happy? Can I take us then to that um, resolution on page 161 to um, resolve the recommendation? All happy? Okay. Moving to page 177, Internal Audit Progress Report, the Scots County Energy State Paper. Thank you, Chair. So, as usual, this is our progress report. It's a, um, an early interim stage in the year. Um, the purpose of the report is to um, provide um, the members with uh, an indication of whether there have been any resource limitations in, our, um, in terms of delivery of the plan. Um, We'll also give you a brief summary of the progress to get made against the plan up to the end of August. Um, we will cover um, also the management's response to any significant issues that were raised in the 2016-17 annual audit review. Um, and then also, which we've just touched on earlier, we'll pick up um, interim results of activities under the Services Quality Assurance and Improvement Programme. We move over to page two, page one seven eight. Um, in terms of audit resources, I don't have too much to say. Them, them, them. We've got um, no issues to raise to members. We've got a full complement of staff. The IT audit provider that we've got in place has hit the ground running, and we're delivering the um, program to agreed timescales with management. Um, so I do not see any um, foreseeable issues which will affect the resources moving forward. In terms of the delivery of the audit plan. Um, you'll appreciate that um, there's a bit of a graduated start at the beginning of the year when we're completing off 16-17 audit work um, and also um, in terms of delivery of that we are in the early stages but are making good progress. Um, certainly from my perspective at the current time there is no, uh, given the resources that we have, there will be no planned audits that are expected to be postponed or cancelled at this stage. In terms of the work that's been uh, delivered so far, if I draw members' attention to um, Appendix A, it's quite a detailed appendix, page 185 onwards. You'll see here, which you're becoming more and more familiar with now, um, a template which has been enhanced with information that members have wanted to see as part of our progress reports. The first part of the appendix covers the entire audit plan for 17-18 and the progress to date with the latter part of the appendix from 189 onwards covering the significant issues or management um, action plans outstanding um, at the current time and how management are responding to implementation of the recommendations. So I think that's quite a good stage to pause to answer any members' questions. Obviously we've got officers here to answer specifics on, some, on, their, on matters that might be within their area. Richard A. Yeah, um, this um, target, 1820, all right, so, so, so just explain to me, is that your target or target for the, um, for the organisation? Yeah, in terms of the 80-20 um, uh, split, this is something that was discussed uh, some time ago with the committee, um, agreeing that they wanted some kind of barometer, some kind of target to set. For who? Any, for the council, not for myself personally. Oh, okay. So these are the results that are from the audits to give the a good indication and set management with a target that would deem to be and um, give them an idea as to whether we've got effective arrangements in yeah. place uh, in terms of internal control so risk. Historically, the performance wasn't as good as you're seeing now. So we set them at the organisation of challenge. Yeah. So that's where the 80 20. Okay. No, I understand. I was just making sure it wasn't your target. No, no, that was obviously put no. due pressure, wouldn't it? Or, no, exactly. uh, and in terms of this, in terms of historically, um, like the chair has said, um, you know, going back six, seven, eight, nine years ago, um, the, it was pertinent for um, this committee to set a target yeah. uh, for management because we weren't anywhere near the sort of 80 20 split, yeah. and you can certainly see in the last the effect of that and how we are. How the management have improved that process together with us over the last four years, and and, and I th and I think this is indicative of, of how the whole council is run. When you look at, you know, you, you look at Daventry District Council as an organisation, and and I, I know that we're here to, to help improve that. 
it's it's a well-run organisation mm -hmm. uh, because of some of these type of things whereby people are encouraged to excel, um, to, to, to do their best, to run good departments, to be efficient, effective, all the rest of it. So, you know, that is just, a, you know, it's commendable that we have that target. And I think it bears fruits in, in, in the ultimate performance of the, um, of, of the council. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Jack, wouldn't mind just adding to that as well. I think you, you're quite right in making, making that conclusion. And also what I'd like to sort of add to that and what the, the um, external quality assessment um, challenged us with the, in terms of the assessor. You know, we're not um, here to sort of stand still with our audit plan. Um, covering the same things year on year. Um, it's about us, and certainly the external review has enabled us to reflect on that, and um, we're always evolving what we audit and from what direction um, to um, get rid of any complacency in that process. So, yeah, that can give you assurance that that's what we're determined to do year on year also. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Carry on, then, Scott. So I'm assuming, Chair, there's no questions in terms of the rest of the appendix A. I'm assuming you're all right, yes. That's OK. So if we move to um, paragraph 4.11 on page 180. Um, to date, um, members will be pleased to hear that there are no minimum insurance opinions being raised against any audits. Um, there has been one audit of corporate significance. Um, which is linked to our strategic risk register, which is around um, the audit of cyber security, which is undertaken by our um, IT audit partner, TIA. Um, you can see from the results of that that they've given us substantial assurance uh, and confirmation that um, the IT team and corporately we have in the right arrangements for that. In terms of then um, the issues that have been raised in the annual audit review uh, that, was, that I presented to this committee in June, um, at the time of that report, um, cash and banking arrangements, and I'm sorry, I'm now onto, pay, onto the next page, under uh, paragraph 4.12, cash and banking arrangements have been resolved at the time of this report, and the two remaining areas, um, uh, good progress is being made by management and uh, looking at the comprehensive uh, infrastructure levy and HR people management and we're due to do some follow-up shortly on those and we'll report back to um, members in our next, next um, focus report. The next two paragraphs are sort of just picked up um, for information really in terms of our counter-fraud audit work that we do and, and where we're involved with that. Um, some of that work will um, be um, captured by management in their annual report at the end of the year. Uh, so we don't go into too many specifics in terms of the investigations that may have started or been um, ongoing. And then there's just to capture there some of the overall audit work that we undertake, which links in with the uh, report earlier, which was on the uh, breaches of the Constitution as well, in terms of the work we do around procurement and the contracts. The last stage uh, of the process report um, picks up the Quality Assurance and Improvement Programme. As I mentioned earlier, this is um, something that we have to report on as part of our reports to the audit committee. Um, a significant aspect of that has been the undertaking of the external quality assessment this year. Um, from my perspective, the results, uh, as was concurred, concurred by um, the Chief Financial Officer, the results were quite favourable for us and was what I was expecting in terms of our ongoing continuous um, development. Um, one of the, uh, just under, on paragraph 4.17, it's um, interesting that um, uh, this, uh, we've undertaken some customer feedback, stakeholder feedback with members of this committee and, and uh, management across the council, um, which uh, the results for which are in Appendix B but reflect um, also the appreciation and effectiveness of the service, which was um, something that was picked up by the assessors uh, within their um, assessment of us. Just on Appendix B, um, Table 1, as it were, has um, Seven people applying, and the table two um, has more. So, did all of the committee and all of the um, um, there was apply? there was certainly after you as you mentioned at the last uh, committee in um, June the the poor attempt, the poor um, response that had been received to the 2016 um, questionnaire. Mm -hmm. Certainly, this time around, the majority were prompted by that. And have responded. Not all, but the majority. So take two off because I suspect the chief executive and the deputy chief executive for the in. So it's five of us and one five on the committee. 
let's put that one out there again. I would have expected 100% response from the committee. So what did you say? There's, um, there's more than five of us on the committee, but only five responded. If you assume that the chief executive and the deputy chief executive replied. Assumptions are people. I know. Yeah. But okay, even if we assume only one of them did, still not the whole of the committee did. So I'll just put that out there again. Thank you, sir. Your approach is noted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I take us back to page 177 then, if there are no other questions? And um, there are two matters that were being asked to resolve. Sorry, Richard Can I ask a question about page 181, uh, second paragraph? Uh, it's about the cyber security yeah. issue. Um, four medium priority recommendations have been made in respect of management assessing the cost and feasibility of deploying an IPS2 dot 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 ensure that all unnecessary and insecure services are promptly disabled. What exactly is that saying? Mm -hmm. Obviously, um, this is quite a technical area in terms of the IT. I'll try to understand. Um, in terms of my understanding of it, I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the, the report has been uh, presented to the ICT steering group, um, who, um, we, in terms of we brought that apart, in terms of our understanding of that, and also then the management response that came from the IT um, service manager. Um, so we have, or the, certainly the ICT steering group has um, uh, challenged the IT service manager to come back with. Yes, what does that word mean? What well, in terms of that? I mean, there are the, there are four issues there that have been separated out and summarised as best as we without giving yeah. you the detail. Intrusion prevention systems are like firewalls. Yeah. Yes. So I, I had to get, get understand the thing about penetration and firewalls or that. Yeah. Just the wording seems to be saying that we should be promptly disabling all unnecessary and insecure services. Yeah, yeah. so those are your, that's your ports. So are you on a 995 port or a 587 port? I have no idea, but in what circumstances are we talking about? Here? Well, that's how you get whaling and fishing coming in. So would you disable... He's a very intelligent bloke, and, and I don't know. <laughs> I have got some detail if you really... No, it's not. It's not. That's important to read in the minutes. I understand not. it. The, 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 the key thing, to, take it out of the room, the, the key thing uh, here is actually a 4.11 uh, first paragraph, is that the council is, is obviously following the Cyber Essentials yes. Scheme. Yes. And that's quite important. Uh, and are we mandated, mandated to uh, be on the Cyber Essentials uh, programme, or are we just following the guidelines? No, not, yeah, not quite... Um, um, not quite how this sort of reads or shouldn't read. In terms of the um, audit, they assessed us against the Cyber Essentials yeah. Scheme. Um, we asked them, or I certainly asked them as part of that audit, to assess whether we should um, go for certification of that particular mm -hmm. scheme. Um, and their um, answer, which I think I've got in here towards the end of top, top of page 181, in terms of um, because there's a requirement with some government contracts oh, yeah. that you have cyber essentials. Yeah, in terms of then the end of paragraph 4.11, just above 4.12, mm -hmm. it was the opinion of RLT provider that um, although form certification to the CES is an option over to the council, in reality the successful obtained PSN accreditation, which is um, very mm -hmm. extensive, that currently offers a level of certification which is more detailed than the CES. So we've gone with that um, yeah. on there. Because there's the cyber essential scheme has three different levels. I'm sure the top level was probably better than the PSA. But it is also now becoming a requirement for our government contracts. Yeah. If we deliver but we're meeting with all their key requirements. Yeah. Um, Go on, uh, Just one thing, because we are looking at the Adam Audit uh, 1718, and I know that all the uh, officers had data protection. And because when we are speaking about uh, the protection, the cyber protection, what have we done? Or are you going to start to have an audit to make sure that the data protection actually come? We have everything in place that we are not exposed because the fine yeah. would be horrendous. Yeah, within, uh, within the appendix, which includes the 17 audit plan, we've actually yeah. got two aspects of work that are around data protection. Yeah. One of us is our involvement on the um, ongoing projects and implementation. Sorry, yeah, page 185, appendix A. Because I didn't see it. So. There's two 
two pieces of work in there. So about four lines of work in the Yeah. So we are involved on the um, ongoing project and implementation yeah. so that we can provide add our advice and support to that uh, group. We're confident that um, the council are moving in the right direction with it, hence our need to not undertake um, an audit in quarter one. But we do have a specific audit that we're going to think on this um, to start at the in quarter four prior to the mandatory date for of May 2018. Yes. Yeah, for, um, and as part of that, there will be presumably um, well, training and awareness as part of that for all staff around uh, GDPR. Go on, Tony. I think uh, well, two points. If we can just go back to um, uh, Council Midwife's uh, comments around the, the technical nature of the, the committee in there. I think, as chair of the ICT Officer Steering Group, I find this very te technical and uh, technical and gobbledygook. And we've asked for our IT manager to translate that into something we can understand and some actions that we can be sure. <laughs> yeah, we can follow. follow. It's good to know the chairman of it doesn't understand right. it either. Well, I don't understand the gobbledygook, that's for sure. Uh, and in respect of general data protection regulations, it's our intention to bring a progress report to the next cycle of the committee. Thank you so much. Okay. Have you, the committee now finished? I can take you back to page 177 for the um, two resolved items. Are we happy, committee? We yeah, are, yeah, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I take us to page 195? We're getting close now, we're getting close. Um, Audra, would you love to introduce the paper, please? I would indeed. Uh, th this particular item was picked up from the KPMG progress report that was considered by the committee that uh, we should look at the outliers reports, which, uh, as a response, uh, members asked us to look. Um, and I'm hoping that um, uh, read all through this, you, you'll see that I've highlighted in particular what they are, but more in particular as to why it's very difficult to use them or take anything from them in terms of going forward. Uh, I'm not proposing to go through them uh, one by one. Uh, I'm quite happy to take specific questions if you have them. But what, what I would like to sort of draw your attention to is that whilst we've looked at them and I've explained in here the reasons as to why it's not always relevant or helpful uh, in terms of what they're telling us, um, uh, it's really the conclusion, um, you know, in terms of the way that the nature of the way the information is gathered to produce the outlines results, there's very limited benefit to be derived from it. Uh, and it really is of more importance when considering value for money is the actual opinion uh, provided by uh, KPMG, who do look at these things, uh, but their, their overall opinion. So I'm um, happy to take uh, questions. Chair. Thank you. I think, Chairman, can I just uh, add a point to Order's presentation? And just to uh, the committee remind, remind themselves that they have endorsed the KPMG's value for money conclusion uh, earlier on in their meeting. Hopefully, the closes get out of jail free card. It does, yeah. <laughs> Don't collect two hundred pounds as your best. <laughs> um, the committee, any questions? The only thing to note is actually the table is quite positive for the council which yeah. endorses some of the comments that were made earlier. Mm -hmm. However, on that basis, I will take you back to page 195, where we note the report. So, hang on a minute. In what way is the total positive for the council? Well, the average uh, per head. So we're the highest 5% of councils yes. uh, on the top four. And the spend on street cleaning, which is explained across the way, which is now no pounds per head. So actually, if somebody says to you, you know, we're not spending much on waste collection, which relates to the 1,124 complaints we've had. Actually, we spend more than what they might. Worth. They might say is that we're wasting an awful lot of money yeah. at yeah. spending yeah. twice as much as what well, we're well, the do. The do. But I, I think you can spin it, Richard. I'm sure. Yeah, I, I, I spin it by saying that clearly we didn't fill in the form properly. If you look at 4.3.2, <laughs> I could possibly comment about orders competence. Sorry, so fill in the form. I wasn't making any comment on orders competence. 
Members, I'd kind of take you back to um, the, the financial statements, if I may, and um, one of the biggest changes in there, and you've picked it up yourself, in the way that we report now, or they want us to report, relates more about the way this council is run and how we are set up. But what it does do is it, is it takes away the ability for a, a reader of those accounts, if you like, to compare. Uh, and we do many things that are different, uh, and this outliers report really shows that in terms of the way that we collect some of the data together, and interpretation as to what category it falls into. Um, I don't believe there was a mistake, it's possible that there was a mistake, but it, the whole point is we all do things very differently now, uh, and the, 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 the accounts in the way that they're presented makes it almost impossible uh, for readers of those statements to make yeah. comparisons, and this is just an example of that, mm. that uh, it really does have very limited benefit mm. uh, in terms of what, of what you can take from it. But that limited benefit is there. Yeah, but the purpose of the RO form is to standardise, isn't it, across the... You know, every council is supposed to fill the thing in the same Absolutely. way. Absolutely, and I'll, I'll guarantee so you, as I'm sure be you know from before, Richard, that uh, many councils will interpret and fill them in differently. They do. Fabio. Thank you. Um, going back to Audra's point about how each council goes on it differently, how do we know that are the outlier, our statistical, statistical near neighbours, are of a similar size to us, the number of roads to us? Um, you don't. So therefore, the value, though we can note it, is it of value? It's a nice sound bite. I think, sorry Chairman, if I may, I think um, it was you as a committee who called for this information. I think at the time we suggested it would be of little value. Um, I, think I, think, maybe, I, think I think maybe we've learned from that, that, maybe our learning from this is that we don't ask again. Yeah. <laughs> Richard, yeah, it's just, just, just a, a, a question really about, do we, um, do we have, like, uh, when police forces are set up, they're set up in, like, in similar groups, like they got, they, they do all the, the, the data and that, so they're all similar size, similar population and that. Do they do that with councils as well? Do, yes, do, do, do audit families. Audit families, oh, yeah. okay. That's, I just, just have to. Did we resolve that way or not? We, did we? Have we done it? I'm, 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 no, you haven't yet. Right, I'll take us back then, can we take it? we note it, Mr Chair. So, can, can we, we note it? it? Yeah. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Agreed. Thank you. If we then go to page 201, which I think I'm introducing, oh, yeah, as sure. the chairman of the council. Sure. Uh, we've got tons of questions about this. Okay. Um, yeah. The first thing I draw your attention to is Roman numerals 1 through 6, <laughs> which is what we're supposed to be doing. And then um, A through F is what I think we've done, led by Tony, of course. Um, we've kind of taken a view on self-assessment of effectiveness because the rules have changed. So I'll let Tony explain that a bit better. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> uh, it's set out on page two or three, actually, the um, paragraph headed of Committee Self-Assessment of Effectiveness. So the, the, the regulations have changed. It's no longer a requirement that a committee produce an annual um, self-assessment of effectiveness. Um, we used to include it in part of the, um, the review, the effectiveness of internal audit was an annual review we used to do to the committee. Of, uh, your own self-assessment was part of, of that review. That has been um, superseded now by the public sector internal audit standards. Uh, and the, that calls for an external uh, quality assessment, which you've had on your agenda tonight. And when committee um, uh, considered moving to the new regime, uh, committee resolved to have a, an internal review um, in between external reviews. External reviews every five years, so either on year two or three of the five year cycle, um, we would have uh, an external review. And what I suggest and, and um, um, suggested to the chairman was that um, that would be the appropriate time to carry out a self-assessment. 
I think an additional factor is that the, um, the template for self-assessment is due for review itself um, and um, uh, perhaps it would be better working from a new established template rather than one that's just, uh, just going out to the fashion. I think it would be important that we ask um, the officers who we work with on our effectiveness as well as our co-councils and to make sure we are doing I think that's in the new template. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Are you content to endorse this statement? Wait for the recommendation, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll, I'll defer that to our monitoring officer to answer that. Um, I think, Chairman, you're tasked with um, providing a, um, an unreport to council, so I think you are. Uh, in agreement that um, this is so, Mr. Chairman, notwithstanding the absence of a recommendation, I propose that we all agree this report for your on the transmission to council. Would somebody like to second that? I'd like to second that. She's there again. Are you all agreed? We are all yeah, agreed, yeah. Chairman. Right. 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 Terrific right. behind you. We're right. You're right here, thank you. Yes. I <laughs> you. <laughs> Moving to page so I'm just peddling behind you. Okay. Moving to page two oh five then. I asked Tony to put this together following your comments and the, the sort of email request that we had and could never organise an extra meeting. So that you could discuss the future work programme of the committee and ensure that it was covering the points that you wanted. Um, what Tony has done is given an outline programme for the meetings to the end of the cycle mm -hmm. yeah, uh, that we have now, um, which takes us up to the January uh, 2018 meeting, so that you can amend, add, change, adjust, throw out anything that you want that's not statutory in that cycle so that we cover all of the matters that you wish to discuss that you raised in your email chain and trails earlier this year. The one area that's not there is risk management. in terms of should we not be challenging some of our colleagues around their use of risk in the development of their portfolios? Question. I think that's within the gift of, uh, of the committee. Because I think it would be useful for us to ask portfolio holders how they're using risk and appropriate governance frameworks etc within their discharge of their role as a portfolio holder. I think we all had a view mm -hmm. at um, mm -hmm. recent council meetings how that might not have been the case, mm -hmm. which many of you expressed to me either at those meetings or by email subsequently. Chair, can I make a suggestion? Mm -hmm. Tony may explain uh, what's uh, currently happening with um, risk management corporately in terms of assessment, mm -hmm. but also from my perspective as an interim order manager. Um, I was tasked with doing, as part of my own programme, tasked our, you know, within our programme, tasked myself to pick up and do a comprehensive review of the risk management um, arrangements. Um, that is um, a duty of mine to provide an opinion to the committee at the end of the year. Part of that um, I don't know who's, uh, uh, in terms of the Zurich report, mm -hmm. who instigated that, who's who sponsored that. Uh, I'm totally sponsored for a Zurich, um, our insurers to do a health check of our risk management arrangements. Um, some of you were involved in the interviews of that. We've also, um, there will be a, a report that comes from that. One of the things that uh, I would like to do as part of that is to overlay some um, additional enhancements or recommendations as part of that and maybe it would be an opportune moment f uh, for members uh, to consider 
the res management response to that report at a future meeting before deciding on how uh, whether they want to um, have portfolio holders or others coming to, the, to this committee. So, what are you going to do next? And the floor. I think just uh, to so one slide on, on what Scott was saying. Uh, yes, I think um, um, within the work program, the responsible health check is, is included in the agenda meeting. The um, assessment was recently carried out, and I have seen um, very recently a draft of, of the report. It's not a final report yet. And that does pick up on, on some of the issues around um, risk ownership by portfolio holders. And I suspect there will be an action plan that will pick up um, those issues for committee's consideration at your next meeting. Thank okay. you. Comments? Colleagues? Yeah, as we should, we're sure not duplicating, so presumably that there, there is a risk register for the organisation. So what is the point then of a second? Is it how the portfolio is holding use that risk register for their own business, not creating do they, do they understand risk? Are they yeah. using it? How are they as, it? as the major risk register yeah. refers to their area of responsibility? Yeah. So we're not going to do a, 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 a risk assessment of our portfolios. No. It's simply going to be looking at what is currently there and whatever's in that relates to us having to use that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. So it's the, we are we are charged with reviewing the effectiveness of, and one of those is a risk management. Yeah. In there. But I think given that we've got the, I forgot about the Zurich thing, even though I did it the other day. Given that that's coming, that would be appropriate to have at the next meeting. And then we can challenge, decide on the future. Because the, the proposal is not just that this is the current cycle, but this would be the framework of the cycle of the committee's activities on an annual basis. So you know what's coming up. Clearly, we can always add and change it. And annually, I'd like us to formally endorse the annual cycle so that you know what's on the agenda and we don't have the email trail and correspondence that we had earlier in the year when we were all trying belatedly to get together so you know what's happening. Yeah? Yeah. Chairman, when you are on your uh, annual thing, you as you know, I am uh, responsible for the uh, member development. So I think it would be a good idea if the members have a refreshment of how to read an audit report or something that is, because as Audra has said, uh, for a lot of members, it is difficult. So could we have something? Um, I think that's, I'm going to pass that back to you, Cecile, as the owner of training to deal with. No, because if, if you, have to, you have to, if you accept that, I can make that proposal, if you think it's a good idea. Because as chairman, yeah. do you think it would be a good idea to... I think trying to get people to come to a training session and how to read our financial statement, you might get very few takers. But would, would you agree? No, no, we, we have. With orders there, you get 100%. Yeah. Oh, Absolutely, yeah. yes, yeah. 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 We, we, we got 22%. We got 20, did we get 28% with um, Mr. Long, Dr. Long? Oh, the 28 members coming? Uh, Councillor Long was certainly yeah. vociferous in rounding yes, your yeah. up. I yeah. can't deny. Mm. Mm. So we uh, can I take that one under advisement, Mr. Sir? So I will do that. Thank you. Okay, so what do you have? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think this is an extremely useful document mm. as a um, yeah. planner for what yeah. we're going to do in future months and years. I've got a few things I would suggest that might be worth considering. <coughs> One of them is, um, and picking up the point about risk, uh, which I think should be on here, is, should there be something on here about performance management? How does the council do its performance management processes? Are there any... Um, um, exception reports that perhaps should be generated and come to this committee. That's the first point. The second point is where there is any form of external um, regulatory inspection of the council, thinking things like the Information Commissioner in respect of Data Protection Act, um, I don't know who it is who does RIPA, the re regulation, who, who does that? Who does RIPA? <coughs> It's, it's, it's a judge. A judge gets sent in to do an evaluation, doesn't it? And thirdly, the ombudsman, who produces an annual report, should those sorts of things be coming to us when we receive those reports or there are breaches? The third thing, an old chestnut for me, I know, 
is this council owns a company in the shape of T-Deckel. Yes, I know it's in the process possibly of being wound up, but it's a valuable asset that belongs to this council. We should have some oversight of how that works and how it regulates its own um, governance processes. So, three items. Tony, can I ask you to uh, consider how we might include those in the process and come back with some views for us? But in principle, you're accepting the table as presented for this year and as a template for next year. I think it's an excellent yeah. step forward. Uh, Chairman, I'll certainly come back on, on two of them. Um, um, I don't know if colleagues can help on with the third one, but if not, we can get back and come back to you on that. I don't think I don't think the answer is yes on the third one. That's why I thought. Yeah. I, I didn't think the answer was going to be. I'm just waiting yeah. to see what formal words is used to say no this time. Yeah. Um, but I wasn't going to make him give you a no tonight. No, well, I'm I'm not able to give you a definitive answer on that one tonight. But in terms of performance management, um, that is the remit of um, scrutiny and improvement committee. <coughs> they receive um, the regular um, okay. quarterly reports. On, on no. Can I just check this? Because is are you dealing with the process of performance management or yes, the performance? Uh, no, not looking at whether service A is doing a good job, but how the council sets up, operates a performance management system. So, so if any service is failing, what is management doing to respond to that? So it's a process rather than a performance issue. Yeah. Just to be clear, yes. that they are two different things. I think, Chairman, if I may suggest that um, Councillor McWright has a word with Councillor Morgan. Fortunately, he's not here today as Chair of um, Scrutiny and Improvement. He has done a lot of work on the yeah, process. I, I was looking to develop my own knowledge. I was thinking of something that the committee perhaps should have a, a pilot. So, so rather than say now, because I know you're our new Marjorie officer, it will take time to consider this. <laughs> Would you like to come back with an answer at our next meeting? I, I will, Chairman. Okay. Are you happy with that? I am. Indeed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On the second point um, on external regulatory inspections, this committee does receive those reports. Um, you've received the local government ombudsman's uh, letter this evening. Um, you receive um, uh, the uh, RIPA and any other information issues on as part of the annual yeah. information report. So, just for clarification, there, if there was a data breach. And if we were reported to the ICR, would, we, would, would that only come to us annually, or would we be told at the time of the data breach and judgment? It would be reported annually under the current um, practice. Given the uh, potential for reputational harm and financial harm, yeah. should that not be brought immediately to us or and or the next meeting? Mm -hmm. Can I again ask you to consider that? Can I just are you saying we've had the Ombudsman's annual letter tonight? No. Have I slept through that? Well, Appendix 2 of um, it's about 880. Chairman, you haven't had the actual letter, you've had the stats. Yeah. The, the stats. stats. Right. Yeah. No, the Ombudsman sends us an annual report, doesn't it? Yeah. Exactly. I think that An anodyne letter. Uh, well, a letter, yeah, but it's still a formal yeah. document. That letter should come to this committee, I am suggesting. Yeah. I mean, let, I, I, an adverse criticism of the council by the ombudsman is a public interest thing. The media will pick it up. Yeah. It's something we should be interested in. Uh, it, technically, it has been reported to us, but you want to see the letter. Oh, I mean, some a digest of some stats from it, maybe. Well, let, let's that's what you've got. I'll see what he actually says. Okay, you want the letter and the digest. Yes. I'm sure we can have. Well, that's it. like having KPMG. You know, because we've got. They would need not come, I'll order because I'm conscious you've got two minutes. Yeah. You're happy now. Deliriously. Excellent. Content. Can we can we approve this work programme and that will be the framework for rolling forward? Yes. Yes, super. I think that's it, isn't it? So, Marina, can we declare the meeting closed? Yes, I can. Thank, thank you. Much. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you for your Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Audra. Thank you, Audra. Thank you, Jenny. Scott, thank you. Thank you, Chair. 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 Thank you, Chair.